So carrying on reviewing Naming Adult Autism, Culture, Science and Identity by James McGrath. So um, a really interesting, um, a re something really interesting that James McGrath mentions in the book, on specifically on page 186, is that the people observed by Leo Kanner, Leo Kanner being um, the first psychiatrist um, to really identify autism, uh, the people observed by Kanner, etc., were actually ahead of the scientists themselves because those original um, people, or children at the time, who uh, have actually established the meanings of what we now call autism. So, in a sense, it wasn't the psychiatrists themselves who um, sort of helped, helped us. It wasn't the psychiatrists themselves who came up with the meanings of autism, in a sense. It was the actual original cases, or rather maybe you could say it was a, a sort of interactive, a dialectic, say, between the psychiatrist and the original cases. Because the psychiatrist obviously had to interpret their behaviour using a kind of a standard sort of uh, ideas of the time. That was often framed from, from a sort of psychoanalytical perspective. So they had to interpret the behaviour. But they needed um, the original cases. But the original cases needed to be there to be interpreted. And the behaviour could have been very different. Um, but it just so happened that those were the original cases that were brought to them. So there's this sort of dialectic relationship between the patient and the psychiatrist. Or, or, or maybe also between the patient's uh, carers, their parents, say, and the psychiatrist. Because the parents had to bring the children to the psychiatrist in the first place. Otherwise the psychiatrist wouldn't have seen the children. Um, and, it could, and, and it could have been that very different children were brought to the psychiatrist. It just so happened that that was the children they saw, but then came to kind of um, determine what we later came to know as autism. But of course, history is very contingent, so it could have been very different. Now, I thought that was really interesting, something to contemplate. Um, another point on page 187 that McGrath talks about is that how fiction by non-autistics takes sociocultural precedence over fiction by autistics which is deeply problematic, and it denies autistic agency to name their own identity. Because, of course, there's many fiction by autistics. It's, it's actually a burgeoning field, actually. And there's a very good fiction coming out by autistic authors. But um, the fiction by non-autistics always takes precedence. And I think, again, you could think, I mean, there's a philosopher called Hegel. I don't know if any of you know about Hegel. Um, I think it was Hegel. Yeah, for dialectic, isn't it? But also... Um, oh yeah, it's Foucault as well. I think Foucault borrowed from Hegel. Um, you know, the idea of kind of uh, narratives kind of fighting for supremacy. So you have sort of a dominant narrative, you have weaker narratives. It's, it's fighting for supremacy, you know, and the dominant narrative is, is, is held or wielded by those who have power. Um, and obviously the oppressed don't have the power. And it's all about trying to gain, it's all about trying to claim the power to speak. You know, as you've seen throughout history, it's always a a kind of a war between different narratives and who has the power to speak. <clears throat> so, yeah, and on page 189, it talks about how, yeah, the name, the name of autism has been a response from outside to the idiosyncrasies of a group of individuals whose way of being preceded such medical recognition. So again, that dialectic, the psychiatrist has to interpret the behaviour of the patients who are brought to them, but, vote, but the experiences of those individuals have pre preceded the psychiatric gains. I mean, the psychiatrist then analyses that behaviour, and that's how and psychiatry develops, it's, it's continuously developing. It, there's no such thing as stasis in psychiatry, it's always developing, you know, understanding of autism has evolved, there's no such thing as... Um, but there's no such thing as a unitary idea of autism because autism is an evolving field. Nothing stays, nothing's static, you know. Um, and I think that's, and that's ironic because, of course, obviously as being autistic, we don't like change as a rule. Uh, but non-autistic people who are supposedly great at dealing with change, the irony is that they get fixed on one idea of autism. And then when we get new information coming to light, they're still fixated on the previous idea of autism. So you've got people saying, you don't look autistic. 
That's because they're fixated on this earlier idea of autism, not realising that actually ideas change and that they need to move with the times. Um, it's a bit ironic there. But yes, yeah, so, so, so therefore, McGrath argues, with what do we then identify? Do we identify with the medical authority or the lives of other autistics? And um, there's a powerful quote here from, on page 189 from a civil rights campaigner, James Baldwin, that McGrath quotes from. That victim who is able to articulate the situation of a victim has ceased to be a victim. But he or she has now become a threat. I thought that was a really powerful quote. Um, because, yes, because as soon as you can articulate your situation that obviously then becomes a threat to that outside dominant narrative because it suggests that actually the person who's so far um, been held down by the powers that be might actually now be asserting themselves for the first time, taking up agency, taking up the banner, um, and potentially, yeah, sees them as a threat because obviously the powers that be don't want to relinquish control. But that's how you get change, isn't it, and, and progress in society. You know, it never comes from the top, it always comes from the bottom, bottom up, grassroots. So, well, that's a very good quote there. Um, and also, interesting to contemplate the nature of the word autism itself. McGrath kind of deconstructs the word, which I thought was quite interesting. He, de he deconstructs the suffix ism. A ism can, of course, connote prejudice. You know, think like racism, sexism, and so on. But it can also signify an ideology, you know, capitalism, communism, socialism, <laughs> um, and so on. It could constitute an, uh, signify an ideology. And also a political movement. For example, uh, self-advocacy. So that's interesting. And I think maybe now, in, in now, I think... We are moving, um, in, we're moving towards greater self-advocacy. So that's something that's very progressive within autism. You know, as autistic people increasingly take over the narrative and um, speak up for themselves, at least those who, who have the ability to do so, obviously. Um, yeah, and talking here about how uh, many people, many people of Asperger's back in the nineties started to form a community. I and mean, that's really important. That's another reason why getting diagnosed is so crucially important in order to find that community. So you can no longer can feel uh, so alone, which is vitally important. I don't think non-autists really appreciate how important that is because they don't have that feeling of being an alien. So they don't need so much to really consciously contemplate what it means to actually not be part of a community. And then obviously when you get diagnosed, you can then find your community. So denying someone a diagnosis actually takes away their yeah, right to find themselves and their right to find a community or people that they can identify. Um, and of course, yeah, the psychiatrist Lorna Wing says nothing exists until it has a name, you know, and, yeah, nothing exists until it has a name. You, in a, so in a sense, you can't exist until you found a name for yourself. It'd be a bit like, say, um, not knowing that you, not knowing what gender you are, for example. Um, I don't know, just an example. But nothing exists, so you, you need, to, naming is a very powerful thing. But obviously, um, g g obviously it, it can be oppressive or empowering depending on whether or not you're named by others or, not, or whether or not you can also name yourself. But that's a whole other debate. Um, yeah, and obviously also once it's been named, you then get the services because obviously if something hasn't been named, it's not going to be any services or any support. Um... Yeah, and he goes on to talk about or how awesome continues to be narrated and represented from outside, which of course I've talked about elsewhere as well. Um, and this reinforces simplifications, which is bound up with the dominant oppressive values of our time, capitalism, patriarchy, and I very much agree. Um, yeah, and he also talks about something called performativity. Now, this was originally coined by Judith Butler in relation to gender studies. He talks about autism diagnosis as performativity. Um, and this is where, for example, the expectation of a gendered identity ends up producing a vague phenomenon it anticipates by providing a framework of expected behaviours. Um, and, and this happens through repetition, the unspoken rules, um, convention. 
Um, so the performative or dominant assumptions surrounding gender, of course, are historically subjective, um, but the repeated acts and expectations kind of congeal, so something fluid becomes solid. And then you have what's called the naturalisation of gender, which emerges through the illusion that certain conventions are natural, inevitable and static. So gender, and gender um, is created by a set of repeated acts within a highly rigid regulatory frame um, that kind of congeals over time to produce the appearance of substance or of a natural sort of being. So that's what Judith Butler argues, and he applies it to autism. Um, but also, in a sense, autism is subversive because such a process of repetition, um, creating a sense of permanence, is what leads to the autism diagnosis. A different rigid regulatory frame is constructed by the autistic herself rather than by the more collective repeated acts that create and sustain the ideas of normalcy. So this argues that autism is actually subversive by providing a different um, sort of performativity to get to, to, to normal, sort of to the norm, as it were, through repetition. Um, but the essence of gender and identity itself can remain fluid, even if it is not truly free from convention. So you can perform both towards and away from the dominant social expectations, but our identities always refer to a performative structure. And then when a performative status or seemingly natural uh, behaviour is uncovered, so is its essence as a social construct. So performance, in co contrary to performativity, is the expression of a subject's agency to alter the repetitions. And naming of autism is a performative speech act, because that's affecting reality by, by its utterance. Um, but yeah, so it's quite complex really, the difference talking about performance and performativity, yes, it's all a very sociological thing, um, so I've only just scratched the surface, but do read the book, um, because Jones Graff explains it um, in the book. Um, so yeah, so a lot, So he talks about um, agency and the importance of um, autistics finding their own voice, um, uh, and um, I thought, yeah, so I'm going to finish now, um, but as I say, do go and check out this book, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed my review of it, uh, so thank you for watching.